It's February 19th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories, making the headlines at this hour. Starting with a planned massive walkout by doctors. Doctors at the top five big hospitals here in South Korea are set to hand in their resignations and stop working as of 6 a.m. on Tuesday, a move against the government's medical school quota hike. While leaving the door open for talks with doctors, related ministries are holding a meeting at this hour to come up with a ways to cope with expected trouble at hospitals. The bruised body of the Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been found in a hospital morgue in the Arctic region two days after he died in a nearby prison. Bruises on his body were reportedly consistent with a seizure. Russia claims its troops have now full control over the Ukrainian town of Adiyuka after Ukrainian troops withdrew. Putin hailed the fall of the Ukrainian town as an important victory, which is Russia's biggest gain since its capture of the city of Bakhmut last May. Doctors at major hospitals here in Seoul are about to walk off the job as the country's medical community and the government clashed over medical school enrollment seats. Related ministries are putting their heads together at this hour to address expected disturbance at hospitals due to absent doctors. Our Shin Sebek reports. Tensions between doctors and the government are mounting as an expected massive doctor strike is only a day away. Last week, the Korean Inter-Resident Association announced that all residents at five major hospitals in Seoul are scheduled to submit their resignations by the 19th and will cease working after 6 a.m. on the 20th. This move is in response to an announcement by the government earlier this month saying it would increase the overall medical student quota by 2,000 to more than 5,000 by 2025 to address the chronic shortage of doctors in rural areas and specific medical specialties. The number of trainee doctors at these five major hospitals is approximately 2,700, accounting for over 20 percent of the nation's total. Should they proceed with their collective departure, it will inevitably lead to a significant gap in patient care. In fact, as of last Friday, a total of 715 residents across 23 hospitals have submitted their resignations. None, however, have been officially accepted yet. The government has also issued return-to-work orders to 103 doctors who have declined to work, with three failing to comply. Medical students are also gearing up to join the protest, planning mass leaves of absence. Last week, representatives from 35 of the nation's 40 medical schools agreed to submit a group application for leave of absence on the 20th. According to the Education Ministry on Sunday, some 116 medical students from Wangwang University filed for a collective leave of absence, though these requests have yet to be processed. Amid the backdrop of collective action by doctors and medical students, Prime Minister Han Dok Su on Sunday called for doctors to refrain from taking collective action. The healthcare vacuum due to collective action is unacceptable. It takes people's lives and health as hostages. The health minister on the same day also sent a stern warning to doctors if they do not comply with the government's directives. We will address the collective actions of the residents by following the law. Under local medical law, the government has the power to revoke the licenses of doctors if they are criminally punished for not complying with an order to return to work. Meanwhile, to further address the mass resignations and leave of absence, the government is set to discuss countermeasures in a meeting with relevant ministries on Monday morning. There, Prime Minister Han Dok Su will focus on the medical community's collective actions and deliberate on strategies to mitigate any disruptions to patient care. Shin se Arirang News. South Korea recently established former diplomatic relations with Cuba, a country that was known for its close links with North Korea. But the significance stretches beyond political relations to economic cooperation that is likely to be highly beneficial for both sides. Our correspondent Oh Soo Young has the details. South Korea and Cuba's new diplomatic relations could lead to a win-win partnership in areas like energy and minerals for advanced technologies. That's according to Seoul's presidential office on Sunday, in press material on the anticipated benefits of bilateral ties, which were formalized last Wednesday. 
beyond the diplomatic significance of forging relations with the Latin American country, which has long held friendly relations with the North Korean regime. Seoul says a permanent mission in Havana can steadily build a foundation for greater economic cooperation, despite the current level of trade being restricted by U.S. sanctions on Cuba. As of 2022, South Korean exports to Cuba hit some $14 million and imports roughly $7 million, mostly through third countries. The presidential office says it expects trade volume to expand through direct trade, noting that Cuba is the world's fifth largest producer of nickel and holds the fourth largest reserves of cobalt, which are both key materials needed to produce secondary batteries. It also produces marine products such as sea cucumbers and items such as luxury cigars and rum. Also, due to the Caribbean country's power generation and infrastructural needs, including telecommunications, as well as demand for household goods and electronics, there is a wide-ranging gap for Korean companies to fill. There are also prospects for expanding development assistance to Cuba and research collaborations in healthcare and the biosector with Cuba's wealth of medical experts. As much as the spread of Korean popular culture has been credited for formalizing bilateral ties, Seoul anticipates greater opportunities for exchanges in cultural events, tourism and sports, including baseball. The presidential office added that once its diplomatic presence has been established, Seoul intends to provide 24-hour consular assistance to Korean nationals in Cuba and also seek out descendants of Korean independence activists who contributed to efforts to liberate Korea from Japan's colonization. Woo Seung, Arirang News. And North Korea must have been shocked by the recent announcement on the South Korea-Cuba diplomatic ties, South Korea's Unification Minister Kim Young was said. He also stressed Pyongyang won't be able to reach Washington or Tokyo without going through Seoul. Our North Korean Affairs correspondent Kim jong sil has an exclusive interview with him. Unification Minister Kim Young-ho told Arirang News that Kim Yo-jung's statement came amid the historic diplomatic development between South Korea and Cuba the day before. I think North Korea must be in shock witnessing South Korea establishing diplomatic ties with Cuba. The only way for North Korea to get out from diplomatic isolation is to give up on its nuclear weapons as demanded by the international community. Some experts warned that Kim Yo-jung's statement may be aimed at trying to sabotage the trilateral relationship between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan. But Minister Kim said this will not be affected. The trilateral cooperation system between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan has never been more concrete since the Camp David summit last August. North Korea will never be able to get to Washington and Tokyo without going through Seoul. On Thursday evening, Kim Yo-jung released a rare statement saying that there may come a day when Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida visits Pyongyang so long as Japan does not bring up issues related to Japanese abductees and the regime's nuclear and missile programs. The statement came as Prime Minister Kishida said last week, now is the time to make bold moves and change the current situation, referring to relations with North Korea. So if Japanese and North Koreans make a bilateral deal, there will be a tension or, or like uh, differences of opinion between the allies in North Asia between Korea, Japan and the United States. And this is exactly something that uh, the North Koreans are trying to achieve here, essentially the travel wedge between Korea and Japan. But the outlook for a possible visit to Pyongyang by Kishida seems unlikely under such conditions. On Friday, Japan's chief cabinet secretary Yoshimasa Hayashi said Japan could not accept Kim Yo-jung's conditions. The Japanese government acknowledges 17 citizens having been abducted by North Korea between the late 70s and early 80s. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. North Korea is yet to comment on South Korea and Cuba's announcement over the forging of official diplomatic ties. But it's continuing to bring Russia closer to its diplomatic circle. We turn to Stephen Norber this morning. Welcome back. Thank you. Nice to be back. Good morning. So no commentary from the North on South Korea-Cuba ties. What do you think the reason is? Well, clearly there's issues about uh, Cuban recognition uh, that concerns them. They have a long history with Cuba. They've exchanged on medical and scientific uh, fronts. Uh, and, and clearly, they've been a strong political ally uh, of Cuba. 
Uh, however, that said, I think we should look at this as something of a win-win. This is very important for South Korea. Uh, clearly, it moves us forward in terms of diplomatic relations. Uh, South Korea enjoys relations now with over 190 nations. Cuba is a very interesting place uh, to be. I went on the first flight uh, commercially out of New York to Havana under uh, President Obama, and that opening was fascinating. There's much to do there for South Korea, including what you've highlighted in your report by way of uh, investment in telecommunications and other economic exchange. And uh, South Korean tourists will find it a fascinating place, Cuban people, culture, uh, and music fascinating and, and a very uh, interesting opportunity for South Korea. That said, there may also be opportunities we're not thinking about, which means maybe uh, there's a potential for communication. Uh, and if we do get back to inter-Korean uh, dialogue at any point, uh, perhaps uh, commonality over Cuba may help. Uh, there are other countries that enjoy relations with both Pyongyang and Seoul, uh, namely Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia is the mm. closest. Uh, and that has balanced out very well in the years, and perhaps there's a soft confidence that can be built over time. Uh, so it's an important uh, move forward for both Seoul and Havana. All right, but in the meantime, the North Korea's Nodong Shimun over the weekend reported its delegation's visit to Russia for an international conference there in detail. They reported that. That's the North's way of showing off its close ties with Russia, isn't it? Oh, clearly, and that's from a North Korean perspective uh, uh, tantamount. I mean, what they're trying to mark since the uh, meeting between uh, Kim Jong-un and Putin uh, near Vladivostok is really a close relationship, and they're signaling that constantly. The uh, North Korean Foreign Minister Che was in uh, Moscow. Uh, there, are talk, there are reports that potentially Putin could visit Pyongyang, uh, and they're trying to shore up those ties. Just today, the Wall Street Journal had a report about Russian tourists to North Korea. But look, that's happening at the cultural level and the people-to-people uh, -people exchange level. Both states find themselves fundamentally weak and isolated, economically weak, diplomatically isolated. Uh, so we should be careful not to overplay these ties. It's uh, an opening uh, which we should monitor, especially by way of our concerns about munitions, about uh, KN-23 missiles in, uh, in Ukraine and the interference in terms of Russian aggression there, especially on a weekend when we mark the sad demise of uh, uh, Alexei Navalny, and mm -hmm. remember that there are human rights concerns both uh, around North Korea and around Russia. Uh, and so Pyongyang Moscow ties are an area of concern, but ones we also need to keep in perspective. Definitely. And a day after South Korea and Cuba announced their official forging of diplomatic ties, their, their leader Kim Jong and sister Kim Yo Jong said a summit between Pyongyang and Tokyo can be on the table under certain conditions. Now, the question is how likely is it to actually happen? I mean, will South Korea let Japan do that? Uh, it's a possibility, and there have been many times in the past when Japan and North Korea have tried to uh, broach relations, and, and they haven't materialized as recently as 2013-2014. Uh, uh, there was progress uh, around 2000, 2002, uh, but that was a very different day, and the uh, ties were, were much warmer by way of inter-Korean relations as well. Uh, so it's something that Prime Minister Kishida is interested in. It helps him in terms of his domestic legitimacy. He's hurting in the polls. He's looking at a September uh, LDP vote and wants to maintain control. And so he thinks it's an important step forward for him domestically. Of course, there are tremendous uh, questions about coordinating that with Seoul. But I think we need to trust the trilateral relationship among the United States, Japan, and Korea. Mm -hmm. And again, look perhaps for opportunities. Is there a communications coordination? Or that could be opened? Is there confidence that might be built in terms of a Japanese dialogue that takes place with North Korea? That said, uh, Kim Yo-jong's warned against either the abductee issue or nuclear and missile issues being brought up. Those would certainly be at the fore of Kishida's concerns. Abductee issues are very important in Japan, and clearly the missile and nuclear uh, issues and concerns about North Korea are in the region's uh, window and certainly a concern among the United States, Japan, Korea, and the international community. Right. Like you mentioned briefly, the trilateral relationship between South Korea, the U.S., and Japan, that seems to be growing only stronger, while North Korea, Russia, and China appear to be struggling to do the same. Um, is that so? I mean, the trilateral cooperation between that three seems quite questionable at this point, isn't it? 
Right. Well, conventionally, people are talking about two blocks, but I would be very careful not to overstate the relationship uh, among Russia, North Korea, and China. I think China is uh, more distant in this triangle. Mm -hmm. I think they're concerned about the Russian carrying cost and about Russian activity in terms of its aggression against Ukraine. Uh, they certainly been taken aback by international reaction, by sanctions and the potential economic input, and that may be affecting their thinking on Taiwan. Uh, Russia and North Korea certainly getting closer together, and that warrants concern. That said, they're not in the same complex that the United States, Japan, and South Korea are. Uh, those That trilateral relationship has democratic values at its base. It has very, very active economic exchange in terms of the first, third, and tenth largest economies of the world working together. Uh, and there's much more that draws together the United States. Uh, South Korea and Japan in good and positive ways, which means a durability that simply isn't there at this time relative to uh, China, uh, Russia, or North Korea. All right. Thank you, as always, for your insight. You enjoy the rest of your weekend there. Thank you. Aloha from Hawaii and all the best. Outspoken Putin critic Alexei Navalny, who made global headlines when he was posing with the nerve agent in 2020, has died at the age of 47 in prison, where he was serving a sentence on charges of extremism. But bruising on his body is raising suspicions about his cause of death. Yi Xingzhe reports. Jailed Russian opposition figure and one of Russian President Vladimir Putin's most outspoken critics, Alexei Navalny, died at the age of 47 on Friday. Navalny made global headlines in 2020 when he was poisoned with a nerve agent but survived, following treatment in Germany before returning to Russia in 2021. Upon his return, he was arrested on charge of extremism and imprisoned before being sent to the IK-3 prison colony in the Yamalnonanets region within the Arctic Circle. Nicknamed Polar Wolf, only those accused of the very worst crimes are sent there. While the cause of death is still unclear, bruising discovered on his body has raised suspicions. Local reports say bruises were found on his head and chest at a hospital close to the prison. One medical source said that the injuries described by those who saw them appeared to be from convulsions. The source added that if a person is convulsing and others try to hold him down, bruising can appear adding that the bruises on the chest can be a result of cardiac massage. Prison officials also said that Navalny said he felt ill before going off for a walk and collapsing. The sudden death and speculation that he had been convulsing have led some watchers to believe he was poisoned once again. The news of Navalny's death drew a forceful reaction from Western leaders, including U.S. President Joe Biden, who blamed Putin, saying that what has happened to Navalny is yet more proof of Putin's brutality. Lee seung Arirang News. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigut said Saturday that Russian troops have taken full control of Aryuka, a town located near Donetsk. According to the Defense Minister's Telegram channel, Russian President Vladimir Putin was informed that 31.75 square meters, uh, square kilometers of territory have been taken from Ukrainian forces. It added that more than 1,500 Ukrainian service personnel were killed in the battle, with the weapons and military equipment abandoned by retreating troops. The town is a strategically significant location for the Russians, as it allows its military to push back the front line from Donetsk, securing the military from Ukrainian attacks. A video of frozen kimbap has gone viral on social media, making more people outside Korea wonder about this particular food. Our An Song Ji went out to see what's so special about this rice-based product. A quick snack or meal widely consumed by South Koreans, kimbap has been increasingly getting attention from outside of the country. It's usually made fresh, but the trend recently is kimbap that's frozen. Korean-American digital creator Sarah Ahn's TikTok video of first trying frozen kimbap went viral with more than 10 million views. She said she was speechless and incredibly happy on how Korean kimbap has become so widely known in the U.S. Basically, every Korean market, which never carried frozen kimbap, um, now sells their own brand, and all those get sold out. So I think it's become a staple 
that's just going to become more accessible um, as time goes on. This company in Hadong, Gyeongsangnam-do province, produces an average of 13,000 frozen kimbaps a day using local vegetables. This is not only for domestic consumption, but also for export to nearly 20 countries. Once a kimbap is frozen, it can be stored for nearly a year and just needs a few minutes in the microwave. As products that contain meat cannot be exported, the kimbap that's shipped abroad is vegetarian and comes in varieties containing tofu, burdock, spinach or other ingredients. We want to eventually build factories outside of Korea so we can produce a wider range of kimbap with fewer limitations. So far, we've achieved our goal in branding kimbap not as Korean sushi, but as something originally Korean with its own name. An expert says that there is more to the wave of Korean food than simply increased interest for Korean content, including K-pop, through social media. Most importantly, this is all possible due to a vast improvement in South Korea's food processing and storage technology that allowed such products to be exported in good condition and taste for consumers abroad. On the back of increased attention for convenient and healthy foods such as this frozen kimbap, exports of South Korea's rice-based processed products saw a hike. The value of exports exceeded 200 million U.S. dollars for the first time last year, which has quadrupled the number from 2015. To enhance competitiveness in the market, the government plans to increase the exports of rice-based processed products to $400 million of exports by 2028. It will also promote growth by investing in R&D and infrastructure. An Songjin, Arirang News, Hadong. Good morning, I'm Kim Jeong, and now we turn over to stories from around the world. We begin this week in the U.S., where two police officers and a paramedic were killed on Sunday morning in Burnsville, Minnesota, when responding to an emergency call of a family in danger. Local authorities have confirmed that the suspected shooter has also died. According to a statement released by Burnsville City, Officers Paul Emstrand and Matthew Rouge were killed along with firefighter and paramedic Adam Finseth. Another officer suffered non-life-threatening injuries. The statement also reported that police were called to a residence at around 1.50 a.m. local time over an armed man who barricaded his home with his family members, including seven children inside. The Minneapolis Star Tribune reported that the police arrived at 2.30 a.m., and that the shooting began about three hours later. The city statement said at approximately 8 a.m., the suspect, the suspect was reported to be dead, and that later in the morning, the other family members left the home and are safe, and that there is no ongoing threat. A New York judge on Friday ruled that former U.S. President Donald Trump had to pay $355 million in penalties for overstating his net worth to deceive investors. In response, Trump, in his opening salvo at a Michigan rally on Saturday night, called the judge a lunatic. The penalty set by Justice Arthur N. Goron is Trump's biggest punishment to date. Over the weekend, Trump lashed out to his supporters at a campaign rally, calling the decision an election interference ploy by left-wing conspirators and saying that the court cases against him are not just an attack on me, they're an attack on all Americans. Justice Ngoron's ruling included banning Trump from serving as an officer or director of any New York corporation for three years, saying Trump and his co-defendants' complete lack of contrition and remorse, and remorse borders on pathological. On Saturday, Trump also launched his own line of gold-colored high-top sneakers at a price of $3.99 at a sneakers convention in Philadelphia. In entertainment news, the 77th British Academy Film Awards, commonly known as the BAFTAs, were held on Sunday at London's South Bank Centre. Taking home the biggest awards of the night was the film Oppenheimer. The three-hour epic on the story of the creation of the atomic bomb won Best Film and Best Director, as well as five other awards. With top celebrities and movie stars present, Killian Murphy won Best Actor Award for his role in the film Oppenheimer, and Emma Stone won Best Actress for her role in Poor Things. 
Scottish actor David Tennant hosted the night, while Hugh Grant introduced the Best Director awards using lines from the Oompa Loompa song from his role in the film Wonka. Prince William, who has been serving as the president of BAFTA since 2010, was also present. Moving over to motorsports, Finnish driver Essa Pekka Lappi won Rally Sweden on Sunday, marking a second win in this season's two races for the Hyundai manufacturer team. Lappi's win is his first personal win since 2017. The South Korean constructor, Hyundai Shell Mobis World Rally Team, also won the season opening Monte Carlo Rally in January, with driver Thierry Nouvelle taking, his, taking the first place. Good morning. It's Usu today, the second spring season term. Usu literally means rainwater, with snow melting into rain and welcoming spring around this time. To meet the term, it's raining nationwide today. Jeju and the South Coast seeing heavier rain with a wind and rain advisory in place this morning. Busan and Ulsan could see up to 80 millimeters coming down hard through the first half of the day. Then central regions will see 5 to 40 millimeters of showers. Rain clouds cap the warmth overnight. You probably have noticed the mist when you stepped outside. The capital is waking up to the warmest February temperatures this morning. But there will be a sharp drop again tomorrow morning. Most parts will see warmer daytime highs despite rain today. Taewoo 21, Jeju topping out at 19 degrees Celsius. Those in the east of Gangwon-do province, however, need to brace for heavy snowfall of more than 10 centimeters tomorrow. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow for Tuesday's edition at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.